We are going to go into our fourth installment of our five-part series on uh, righteousness by faith. I have to say, I have learned so much studying this, and um, even going into it, didn't realize the gravity of this topic and how little it's actually preached in pulpits. Um, so I ask that you pray, as this is probably the, this one and the next one will be two of the more challenging in the series. So um, our scripture reading for today is taken from Revelation chapter 14, and actually we'll just read verse 12 here. Revelation 14 and verse 12, which says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Our message is entitled Righteousness by Faith and the Three Angels' Messages. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. I ask now, Lord, that you once again just make me a nail on the wall. Hammer that nail in, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. And then hang a portrait of Jesus Christ upon the nail. There's no reason for me to be seen today, Lord. We need to hear a word from the throne room of grace. So, Father God, bless us now as we dive into this critical end time topic. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. So we're going to go and look at, first I'm just going to read through Revelation 14, the three angels' messages. In fact, as you all are probably aware, that is literally uh, the name of our church here, the three angels, Seventh-day Adventist Church. If you've ever asked why that is the name of the church, these are the verses from which the name is uh, gathered. This is where we take it from. And I'm going to read through the three angels messages Then we're going to go through and we're going to look at how righteousness by faith is applied and especially and particularly the prophetic ramifications of what are in these verses. Revelation 14 and verse six says, and I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Verse eight, and there followed another angel. This is the second angel saying Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receives the mark of his name. Here's our scripture reading again. Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. These are very staggering, profound warnings given by three angels. So let me lay down some ground rules. These are not literal angels. Angel in the, in the Greek and even in the Hebrew, it, you, it goes back to the word for messenger. There are three messengers and there are three, in other words, three times or, th or three, three messages that are proclaimed towards the end of time. And these three messages are critical to understand. These messages are critical to share because these messages are, 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 have everything to do with finishing God's work on earth. So let's get deeper into each one. So obviously this is, before I go into the first angel, if you look at all of the denominations of Christianity, most of them don't say or do much with these verses. That's what's interesting. If you were to go and look, as I've been researching, there's not a lot on these verses. I'll show you one in a second, one a denomination that does, and it, it's, it's one of the oldest of all of the denominations. And so in general, this is unique to Seventh-day Adventists. And it's one of the things that people don't ridicule us about very much. 
Why, one of the reasons is I don't think most people get the significance of the verses. They just people read the book of Revelation. In fact, there are denominations that will tell you that you should not read the book of Revelation because it is a closed book. Have you ever heard that? Now, isn't that interesting that God would close a book and then call it Revelation? So understanding this book is critical. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's really the full name of the book. So if you want to go, we look at the first angel. And the first angel deals with this everlasting gospel. Let's go to Revelation 14, 6 and 7. It says, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people. So when we jump in here, um, if we had time, we'll go back through the prophecies of it. But basically, we start during the 1260-year prophecies we talked about in the last series. Something happens and a special message is given to the entire world. It is a message for the everlasting gospel. Now, the everlasting gospel is the, that those words are relevant. In fact, that word everlasting is seldom in the Bible used with the word gospel. One of the things you must understand is that this gospel is permanent. Even when we get to heaven and we are walking the streets of gold and Jesus raises his hands, you will still see the nail prints in his hand. The study of, this, uh, of, the, of the plan of salvation, the, the science of salvation is something that we will do throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. When we, there's one of our favorite hymns to sing at the house, when we begin to tell the story of how God delivered us out of this world, the song says the angels will have to fold their wings because the angels have never experienced redemption by the blood of Jesus Christ. It is an everlasting gospel, and its goal was to go all over the world. Now look at verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, look at what it says. Fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. This verse is fulfilled in terms of message in the early 1800s. And we'll come back to that in a second. But that word fear there is not the fear like you think to tremble in, in, in like being afraid. It is to reverence. Um, it, it is to come to him in awe. He starts off by saying fear God. Why? Because the world would cease to reverence God. And prophetically, we'll talk, I, I, I did some talks at GYC, we talked about the French Revolution and how the French Revolution disseminated to the world the idea of secularism and humanism. And um, instead of the God of heaven, they instituted the God of reason. In fact, in one of the churches in Paris, they actually took a statue and put in the goddess of reason and they began to worship the goddess of reason. So the Bible here is telling us that the time would come and it has come where we would fear God and give glory to him because the hour of his judgment has come. Again, uniquely to the Adventist church, we preach about the judgment. We speak about the investigative judgment. But then it does something else. It says to worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. You see that? Where else in the Bible do you see that language? Well, you see it in Exodus chapter 8 and verse 20. Remember what that is? Uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. And Exodus 20, verse 8 is the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Right? It says, in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and the Lord rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he did what? He hallowed it. Now, so some people say, well, why do you go to church on Saturday? Why do you keep the Sabbath? Well, one of the reasons is the Sabbath was instituted before sin ever entered the world. And the Sabbath will continue after sin has exited the world. According to Isaiah, he says, from one new moon to the next and from one Sabbath to the next shall all flesh come before me. And that's speaking of the new heavens and the new earth. On both sides of sin, the Sabbath will be kept. You don't think the Sabbath should be kept now? So there was a cry that one, God would be feared. 
And in fact, it was, it was literally in, or in and around 1844 when these calls were made by the early uh, Adventists, before there was a Seventh-day Adventist denomination, the Millerite movement, there was a call to reverence God. There was a call to glorify him, to, to give glory to him. Why? By living a Christian life. The hour of his judgment, this, pre, this investigative judgment that would happen, and we, and we now know started in 1844, all of these things would happen. And one of the other truths that was brought in to this first angel's message is that Sabbath truth. I tell you the story all the time of Roger Murnau. We met his daughter recently when we were in, um, in uh, Oregon a few weeks ago. And, um, and, in, and when, he was a, when he was still worshiping the demons, and if you haven't read his book, A Trip into the Supernatural, I recommend it if you're kind of ready for it. But as he was coming out of demon worship, uh, when he was in demon worship, I should say, he was in a mansion in Montreal, Canada, where they used to do, worship the devil. And he says that they were t- the, the demon priest was talking about uh, the two great lies that Satan loves the most. Two great lies. The first great lie that Satan lo- loves is that the world believes that when you die, you're not really dead, that you either go straight to heaven or straight to hell. Satan loves this lie because the, but the Bible says that the wages of sin is if you never actually die, that means there's no consequence to sin. So Satan loves that lie. And he loves that the whole world, they even have a TV show, I've never seen it, a TV show called Ghost, right? Or something like that, Ghost or something like that. They have the movie that was Ghost with, with Demi Moore and Whoopi Goldberg years ago. This idea that you don't die and really die is one of, their, one of the ideas that are prominent and it leads into spiritualism. That's the first one he said. They love, they, Satan loves that the world believes that you, when you die, you don't really die. But the second one he said is that the world reverences Sunday as a Sabbath. Those are the two great lies that Satan loves. And one of the people, if you can read the book um, for yourself, one of the people in the back of this demon worshiping meeting raises his hand to the demon priest and says, what about the Adventists? And the demon priest says, oh, you know, I forgot about them. There's so few of them. He said, they cannot be deceived because they keep the Sabbath. Bringing the Sabbath back after it had been discarded, after the Roman church, the Roman Catholic church had changed the day, going all the way back to the days of Constantine, changed the the solemnity of the day as they say it from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. And all of the churches had followed suit. It was, it took time, it took effort. But when God was ready to raise up a church, this is one of the truths that had to be raised up with it. Now, I told you there's one denomination that actually does speak to the the, the three angels' message, and they only actually speak to the first angel, and that is the Lutheran denomination, which is really the first denomination to break away from the Catholic Church. And so this is the image of the first angel on uh, Martin Luther's um, uh, Bible. So he had this this insignia on here. Um, And so many, there are Lutherans who believe that Luther was the first angel, that he came to preach the everlasting gospel because he taught righteousness by faith at a time when the Catholic church said you should pay indulgences. You guys ever heard of indulgences? That you actually pay money and you can, um, you know, get favors with God or, you know, I always tell a story and one biographer says that John F. Kennedy um, when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, he was from a good Catholic family. So when he died, they paid $10,000 in 1963 money. They paid $10,000 and had him move from purgatory into heaven for 10 grand. That's not a bad deal, if you ask me, uh, personally. <laughs> you can sell a car and get 10 grand and not have to worry about what you do in this life. But it doesn't work like that, church. You can't pay it off. Martin Luther was a, was a profound and, and powerful reformer. Um, you know, he, he is the one who in 1510, he was sent to Rome uh, where he witnessed the corruption of the Roman church. Uh, he climbed the Scala Sancta, the holy stairs, the stairs that were supposedly moved from Jerusalem to Rome, the, uh, covered in marble that they say uh, Jesus climbed to go and, and meet with Pilate. And he, as he was going up, you have, to, you have to go up the stairs. If you've been to Rome, you've seen them. You have to go up the stairs on your knees. And as you're going up the stairs on your knees, um, you know, your, your sins are being absolved. That's, that's, a, that's a crazy one, huh? 
Now, it is said that Martin Luther heard whispered in his ear as he was going up the stairs, the just shall live by faith. You can't climb stairs on your knees and have your sins taken away. You can't take the, the little things and flog yourself and have your sins taken away. No matter how many times you press the beads or say the holy rosary, none of that removes sin. Sin is removed by one thing, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. And he needs no, uh, no uh, uh, co-operator uh, with him for it. Here he is uh, where Martin Luther um, attaches the 95 Thesis uh, to the Castle Church in Germany on October 31st, uh, 1517. Now, isn't it interesting that when we say October 31st today, what comes to your mind? Halloween. Do you think the devil was wise in uh, co-opting October 31st into a day of, go of ghosts and goblins and witches and all kind of Jason masks and all kind of stuff running up and down the street? When in fact, what should be remembered, it was that on that day, the Protestant Reformation was born. It was there that I would have to say to some extent, and maybe I don't fully agree with it, but on some level, Martin Luther did exactly what the first angel did. He began to proclaim the everlasting gospel. And I, and, and, if, if we have maybe later in another series, we'll do a, a series on just church history. People ask why there's so many denominations. The reason there's so many denominations, if you start at the beginning, the Catholic church had taken control, except for some Orthodox churches that were not under their control. But over time, when Martin Luther broke away, he broke away and took the truth of righteousness by faith with him. And then others came and took the truth, uh, like Calvin, the truth of, of baptism by immersion. And so you got Baptist. And then another one took a truth and it kept coming down, but they stopped short. And that's why the first angel's message is most uh, perfectly proclaimed as it was proclaimed in the early 1800s, calling everyone back to worshiping God as he's supposed to worship in, in fear and, 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 and uh, of reverence and spirit and in truth. This is why the Sabbath is so important because it is a, to reestablish the worship the way God said he ought to be worshiped. Martin Luther did not live an easy life because of this decision. But he proclaimed that everlasting gospel. And that was righteousness by faith. I love some of his quotes. I figured I'd throw one in here. There's a good one. He says to all of those to future preachers out there, always preach in such a way that if the people listening do not come to hate their sin, they will instead hate you. Powerful quote by Martin Luther. If we're going to preach the everlasting gospel, you can't preach the everlasting gospel so that it makes people feel warm and fuzzy. The truth of the matter is the word of God is like a two edged sword. That means the gospel doesn't always make you comfortable when you have to, when you're faced with the fact that you need to change, when you're faced with the fact that something has gone wrong, when you're faced with the fact that, that, that you are not exactly right, it's not comfortable when someone calls out your pet sin. But I want to tell you, real love tells you when you're in danger. The Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary on Revelation 14, 7 says this, furthermore, the call to worship the God of heaven as creator of all things implies that due heed be given to the sign of God's creative works, the Sabbath of the Lord. See on Exodus 28 through 11, as, we, as I quoted earlier. If the Sabbath had been kept as God intended, look at this church. If the Sabbath had been kept as God intended, it would have served as a great safeguard against infidelity and evolution. The Sabbath will be a point especially controverted in the closing crisis. The everlasting gospel. You know why the Sabbath is a part of the gospel? Because somebody say, well, it's just another thing to do. But if you really are in Christ, we talked about this week where people celebrate love, you know, last week. But if you really are in love with someone, is it painful to spend time with them? If it is, you, you might be with the wrong person. I don't mind. I love the Sabbath because I love having time to spend with God. If righteousness is by faith, I need to spend time with God so that my faith will grow. 
That's why this is tucked into the first angel's message. That's why it's a part of the, of the continued reformation that happened in the early 1800s as the Millerites and the early Adventists began to scour the Bible for truth. This is why it comes into the truth, because you need to have this time set apart to spend with God. Huh. Great Controversy, page 379. The first angel's message of Revelation 14, announcing the hour of God's judgment and calling, up, uh, calling upon men to fear and worship him, was designed, look at this church, was designed to separate the professed people of God from the corrupting influences of the world and to arouse them to see their true condition of worldliness and backsliding. In this message, God has sent to the church a warning, which had it been accepted, would have corrected the evils that were shutting them away from him. Had they received the message from heaven, humbling their hearts before the Lord and seeking in sincerity a preparation to stand in his presence, the spirit and power of God would have been manifested among them. The church would have, gained, uh, would have again have reached the blessed state of unity, faith and love, which existed in apostolic days. When the believers were of one heart and of one soul and spake the word of God with boldness, when the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. If the first angel's message had been heeded, but it wasn't, a great disappointment, as they call it, occurred, which is really a purging, a purifying of the church. People scattered and went in all directions and held on to error. And because of that, the church, especially here in the United States of America and in the West, was made feeble. And if it, you couldn't have maybe seen it then, but you sure see it now, where the church is on its, on its, on its hind legs, backing up, afraid, as the culture, this environment presses against the church. The Bible says that we are supposed to be the ones doing the presence. The Bible says that the gates of hell would not prevail. That means we're going forward if the gates of hell don't prevail. But instead, the church has been weakened. Why? Because the church allowed error, and that error allowed the church to become part of the culture. And now the church, and this is where we're going to, go, we're going to show you where this goes. What ends up happening now is the church, in its weakened condition, wants now to uh, make America moral. They watch the same TV shows the world watches, listen to the same music the world watches, uh, listens to, and then they say, no, but we want everybody to, be, to live like Christians. And in order to do this, then, they will for try and force morality. We'll come back to that. There's a great quote here from um, the SDA Bible commentary on Revelation 14, 7. It says, made heaven and earth, speaking of the first angel again, the creator of the universe is the true and only object of worship. No man, no angel is worthy of worship. This is the prerogative of God only. Creatorship is one of the distinguishing features of the true God in contrast with false deities. The appeal to worship God as creator has become especially timely in the years following the initial preaching of the first angel's message because of the rapid spread of the theory of evolution. Our next series is going to be on creation versus evolution. And we're going to go into the science and show you why this is such a demonic teaching. But the first angel tells you to glorify God because he made the heavens and earth. The second angel speaks to the fall of Babylon and the confusion um, that confusion has had its end. Revelation 14 verse 8 is the second angel's message. It says, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So in order to get this, we got to go deeper into Revelation. And we don't have a lot of time to break down all of it, but let's, let's look at Revelation uh, 13, 18. We're going to look at a few verses to really try and make this come to life. I'll read the second angel's message again. Now, the first angel and the third angel both have a loud voice. This one doesn't, interestingly enough. And they're following another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. I'm going to allow the Bible to expound on this. And so we go to Revelation chapter 13, and we're going to read verses 11 uh, through 13 on this slide. It says, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Remember from our last series, what, be what does this represent? The United States of America. Now, some of you weren't here for that. But I want to submit to you, and I don't have a lot of time, like I said, so you can go back and watch it. But 
America is uniquely placed in the scripture in Revelation chapter 13. In the first half of Revelation chapter 13 is the papal power. And you can read that during the dark ages of the, of the 1260 year prophecy, the power she had. That beast is wounded, the scripture says. That power is wounded. And we know that that happened in 1798 when Napoleon's general Berthier went in and took the Pope captive, brought him to France where the Pope died in captivity. After that, republics, you know, uh, representative republics took over as a predominant form of governance around the world. And uh, the greatest of all of these republics was the United States of America. Somebody ought to say amen. I say this all the time. People are angry and they, they have all this vitriol towards America. Let me tell you something. You, unless you travel the world, you have no idea how good it is in this country. You get to actually go in the street and yell at this country. You can call the president names and nothing happens. You go to some other countries, you, you speak sideways about the president. You've just vanished. Poof. Now, what made America special? Despite her failures, despite her mistakes, what made America special? It was the documents. It was the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights. It is where they said, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. It's the First Amendment to that Constitution that says that we all have a right to religious freedom, right? All of those things that were codified in the Constitution allowed America to be described here by John in Revelation 13, 11, as having two horns like a lamb. Are you getting this? Why does Protestant Christianity, why is it different than almost every other religion in the world, really? Why is it that Protestant Christianity, when it established a, a nation here in North America, why did it do it different in other places where you could worship freely? Because the Bible teaches that you have to give people a chance to choose. So there was, and, the, and the founding fathers were escaping Europe where they were being uh, um, persecuted for their religious beliefs. So they established America as a place where you could come and worship freely. I want to tell you that there are parts of the world to this day, you can't, matter of fact, the majority of this world, you cannot worship freely. There are countries where if you are not of the majority religion, you can be put to death today. And tens of millions, maybe even hundreds of millions of people live in that situation. And we live in America and we take for granted that on a snowy day, you just get in your car and drive to church. You don't think that the government followed you. You don't think that the government has uh, microphone. I mean, some of y'all might, but I'm not too worried about the government listening in. I hope they hear the message and the songs. But the Bible gives this warning in Revelation 13, 11, that this beast and a beast represents a nation or a kingdom or a political power, that this beast that came up out of the earth would also one day speak as a dragon. And what does that mean? Well, you go back to the first beast. Like I said, we don't have time. It is that there would be a unification of church and state to force people to behave the way the church wants it to. These are the warnings of the three angels' messages. And I'm going to show you how it ties into righteousness by faith. Verse 12. And, he, and so the first beast, again, is the Catholic church. And, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. We talked about that. That was after Berthier did what he did. And he doeth great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men and deceives them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. And this image to the beast, we as Adventists believe, is one day forcibly making people keep Sunday as holy, as has happened in history past. People say that we're crazy to believe this, but the truth of the matter is, if you go to a grocery store on Sunday, they make an announcement that they're about to stop selling alcohol. They don't make that announcement every other day of the week. This country already has blue laws. People think we're crazy, but it, it, literally it already exists. What we believe is that it will be expanded. So that's where it, it hints to that there. And they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, this, this law, uh, making Sunday observance mandatory, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So here's where it gets interesting. 
If you do not follow this, one day a death decree will be passed. We talked about that in the last series. Revelation 13, 16. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive the mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. What is this mark of the beast then? It is that you are no longer aligned with God in worshiping as he dictates. And one of the key signs of that is you will then worship on the first day of the week rather than on the seventh. And if you don't do that, the government will make it so that you, in verse 17, that no man might buy or sell unless he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And verse 18 says, here is wisdom. Let him that understands count for the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score and six. And I see now young people, they tattoo 666 on themselves and whatnot. They're rap groups like the three six mafia, six, 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 three sixes, right? People get into the sixes. The sixes are simple. It represents a man. Which man? This is the papacy itself. And Catholics today are seeing that as this particular Jesuit, first ever Jesuit pope is in power, he is turning the Catholic church upside down. Prophecy is being fulfilled because he's doing things. You can just go and read what's happening. Even Catholics are upset with the pope. We are on the verge of these things coming to pass. The next verse in Revelation I want to hit as we look at this second angel. It says, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. So this is really like the fourth angel. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen. Who is Babylon? This is this corrupt religious system, uh, geopolitical religious system. Babylon is the great has fallen and has become the habitation of devils. And the hold of every foul spirit in the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Why has that happened? Look at verse three. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. This shows you that in end times, there is this weird mixing of economics, politics, and religion. Verse 18 again, uh, chapter 18, verse four again. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, and this is the call to us. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues for her sins have reached unto heaven and God has done what? He's remembered her iniquities. The call, if Babylon has fallen in the second angel's message, the call in Revelation 18, when this fourth angel, as it were, proclaims, is that you come out of Babylon. What are you coming out of? Confusion. A muddied version of the truth. The mixing of truth and error. A deception so, so, so much so that the Bible says, if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Church, are you studying your Bible? Are you looking at truth in such a way that when the great deceptions come, you will be able to stand no matter what? Are you prepared to come out of Babylon, even though coming out of Babylon will cost a, will cost a, a great price? Jeremiah says, if you can't keep up with the footmen, how are you going to run with the horses? If right now you struggle to live a life God is asking you to live, to submit yourself to him, will you really be able to keep up when these great times of panic and trial come? I'll read that second angel one more time before we go to commentary. Revelation 14, 8 says, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She made the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. I'm going to break that down in a second. But they thought that by drinking it, they would have peace. As we'll see. Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary on that verse. The prophecy of the fall of Babylon finds its last day fulfillment in the departure of Protestantism at large from the purity and simplicity of the gospel. This message was first preached by the Advent movement known as Millerism in the summer of 1844 and was applied to the churches that rejected the first angel's message concerning the judgment. The message will have increasing relevance as the end draws near and will meet its complete fulfillment with the union of the various religious elements under the leadership of Satan. 
The message of chapter 18, we just read two through four, announces the complete downfall of Babylon and calls upon God's people who are scattered throughout the various religious bodies compromising Babylon to do what? To separate from them. All nations, this is a universal apostasy is what it's saying. Drink, a figure describing the acceptance of the false teachings and policies of Babylon. Look at this. Coercion is suggested in the phrase, made all nations drink. Religious elements will bring pressure to bear upon the state to enforce their decrees. And I'm going to show you that that has already begin, begun to happen. The wine of the wrath. The figure is probably borrowed from Jeremiah 25, 15, where Jeremiah is bidden to take the wine cup of this fury and cause all nations to drink it. But wrath is not Babylon's object in offering the wine to the various nations. I just mentioned this. She contends that drinking of her wine will bring peace to nations. But look at what the commentary says. However, the drinking of it brings down on men the wrath of God. So what does this mean? Here's the word fornication. And all of us think, you know, you, fornication in a physical sense. But here's what it says. A figure of the illicit connection between the church and the world or between the church and the state. The church should be married to her Lord, but when she seeks the support of the state, she leaves her lawful spouse. By her new connection, she commits spiritual fornication. Now, I'm going to show you that this, again, is happening already. If the church seeks the state to make the world moral, and this is from the SDA Bible commentary, if the church seeks the state to make the world moral or live according to its laws, watch this, then spiritual fornication has been committed because the church is seeking the world's help to make man righteous. This, watch this church, this is the opposite of righteousness by faith. So how do the, these messages tie in? If you are trying to make the world live right by laws and police and, and policing, then you have forfeited the concept of righteousness by faith. You have now dragged down the first angel's message and tossed it aside. And is this happening now? Well, this is our, our new um, 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 head of the, um, the, the Congress. Um, my, uh, Mike Johnson, he, and this is what he said to Sean Hannity on, of Fox News when I think Sean Hannity's still there. Someone asked me today in the media, they said, it's curious. People are curious. What does Mike Johnson think about any issue under the sun? Mike Johnson replies, well, go pick up a Bible off your shelf and read it. That's my worldview. Now, that's a beautiful thing. As a Christian, you should have the Bible as your worldview. But if you're leading the country and you say you're going to make policy based on the Bible. Here's the challenge. You and I are both call ourselves Christian, but we don't agree on which day to worship. So if you're going to make policy around that, am I going to now have to worship the day you say? Well, it's not just him. This is uh, Laura Bobert. She says she is tired of separation between church and state. The church is supposed to direct the government. This is the fornication spoken of in the book of Revelation several times. I want you to see that the Bible doesn't lie. This is what's prophesied. And already we have elected politicians. And this is, these are not the only two that would do this. She said, Lohan Boebert claims 19th Amendment does not exist because God gave Moses only 10 amendments. What? Moses doesn't have the amendments to the Constitution of the United States. Church, this is what is going to begin to happen. In a cry to fix America and the world, in a cry to turn America back to her Christian roots, in a cry to do all these things, they will seek now to do it by force. And this, as we just read, is the opposite of righteousness by faith. We get to the most in-depth of all of the angels, the third one. Revelation 14, verse 9, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his head, forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. If any man worship the beast in his image, if they do not um, say, listen, I'm going to follow what God says uh, uh, in the Ten Commandments and, and keep his Sabbath, if 
if they say, listen, I'm going to go with the world in order to keep being able to buy and sell and in order to protect my life, I am going to follow the world. I am going to do what the government says. Then you receive the mark. There's nobody getting the mark right now. People go to church on Sunday now, there's no mark because there's no government mandate yet to keep Sunday holy. But when it comes, there will be those. And let me tell you something, you're going to be shocked at folk who are going to come up with excuses to do what the world says. Verse 11, and the smoke of the torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receives the mark of his name. So you refuse to accept the seven day Sabbath, the rest that God said. The Bible says, and God rested on the Sabbath day. He calls us to rest, Hebrew chapters four, to rest on the Sabbath day. And because you would not rest the way God says rest, your punishment is that you get no rest. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here is wrapped up and sealed the truth of righteousness by faith. The patience of the saints. This is the enduring strength of the saints, the way patience can be read. This is the patience of the saints. While Babylon is doing all of these things, this is, it's all connected. While the world is trying to force you to worship the way it wants, while your religious freedoms are being extracted and, and economic systems work against you and all these things begin to happen, the church will have patience. The Bible says it like this. Actually, Jesus says it like this. Jesus says, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. This is the patience of the saints. It means that we are rooted and grounded in truth. These are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here's what the faith of Jesus means or faith in Jesus. The Greek may be understood either way, though the latter meaning is generally preferred for the difference in meaning between the two expressions and for the importance of faith. expression. You can see Romans 3.22. The faith of Jesus and the keeping of the commandments represent two important aspects of Christian living. The commandments of God are a transcript of the character of God. They set forth the divine standard of righteousness that God would have man attain, but which in his unregenerate state, he cannot attain to. The carnal mind, the Bible says, is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. Despite his best attempts, man continually comes short of the glory of God. This is what we talked about the last few sermons. But Jesus came to enable men to be restored to the divine image. That's why Jesus came. I was studying with my family last night on Zoom, my family all across the country, the the first two chapters of Genesis. And we got to chapter three last night, actually. And we were looking at it, how man was made in God's image. And when man sinned, he fell. Jesus came to restore us back to that Edenic state, to bring us back to where God created us to be in the first place. He came to show men that the father, what the father is like. And in, in this simple, in this sense, amplified the moral law through his power. Men are enabled to keep the divine requirements and thus reflect the divine image. This is righteousness by faith. The remnant church thus honors the commandments of God and observes them not in any legalistic sense, but as a revelation of the character of God and Christ who dwells in the heart of the true believer. That's why we keep it. We keep it because we have a relationship with God that is powerful and true. And this speaks to the process of sanctification. This is, so we talked about justification. Sanctification to me is like little tiny pieces of justification that we are constantly going back and being justified. Constantly going back and having God move on us. This is the definition. The action of making or declaring something holy. The sanctification of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. The action of or process of being freed from sin or purified. The process of sanctification takes deliberate action on our part. Sanctification means God has taken you and you're being set apart. Sanctification also means that every day you are moving to have a character more like Christ's character. So here's what's interesting. If you Google the word and you look up the word, this, the word sanctification and some of its derivatives, look how much at the time when the, when, the, when the first angel and the second angel sounded, look how much you could find these words in literature. 
You see that? Look at what happened as the, as, as, as the, as the world became more secular and drifted away. The word stopped being used so much. Even Christian churches now don't talk about sanctification. They don't want people to feel like they have to improve who they are. But let me tell you something. Something's about to happen. You see how it starts coming back up here? We're going to talk about the fact that righteousness by faith means you will be sanctified. You will be set apart. You will gain victory over sin, not because of your strength or power, but because of Christ's. Here's what she, Letters of Manuscripts, volume 23, she says this. Let us practice the meekness and lowliness of Christ's life, and the seed we sow will grow. Here's what she says. Sanctification of character is the work of a lifetime. Our opportunities will multiply as our experience uh, enlarges. Our knowledge will increase, and through Christ we shall become strong in bearing responsibilities. Oh, precious privilege to cooperate with the heavenly and divine agencies. This church is our goal, the purpose of righteousness by faith, why it is attached to the three angels' messages, and the third angel in particular is that it is only by faith that you will have the strength to stand when the time of trouble and crisis comes. You won't be able to do it because you knew it was coming. Just knowing it's coming is not enough. The demons believe and tremble. You will do it because you have an abiding faith with Christ, that you are connected to him, that you have a, a, a relationship with Jesus, and, and that you have, you have studied his word and made it a part of who you are. If you are not doing that now, when the time comes you think to do it, it will be too late. This is from the book, De, uh, Dennis Smith's book, 40 Days. He says, righteousness by faith and the third angel's message are closely related. It is only through experiencing righteousness by faith in Christ alone that one will avoid being deceived by the last day antichrist power. Revelation 14 gives a serious warning about not worshiping the beast or antichrist. Then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark in his forehead, on his forehead or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. Look at this. The third angel's message calls men and women to obey God's commandments, including the fourth commandment which admonishes us to keep holy the seventh day Sabbath. The message includes a warning to all who turn from God and receive the mark of, of the beast, which Satan's counterfeit day of worship. Those who receive the mark of the beast will experience the seven last plagues and be lost. The purpose of the message of righteousness by faith in Christ is the same. Righteousness by faith leads men and women to obedience of God's commandments as they, in faith, allow Christ to live out his life of righteous obedience to God's law in their lives. Righteousness by faith leads to keeping God's commandments. This happens not by man's efforts, but by faith in Christ to manifest his commandment keeping in one's life. Ellen White understood, and he's quoting Ellen White here, when she wrote of God seeking to bring the message of righteousness by faith to the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1888. The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. I never got a chance to really talk much about them. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Thus, justification by faith is the third angel's message. The preaching of righteousness by faith is the preaching of the third angel's message. It is true that the threefold message announces the fall of Babylon and calls out, uh, out of her God's people. It is true that the message also warns people against uh, the worship of the beast and his image. Here's the kicker. Watch this. But what could the announcement of the fall of Babylon and the warning against the worship of the beast and his, and his image amount to simply as such? without the power of God to save the people from Babylon and from the worship of the beast and his image. Therefore, the everlasting gospel, the preaching of righteousness by faith, is the third angel's message in spirit and in truth, because this is the very thing and the only thing that can make effective the announcement and warning of the message. You will not ever be able to heed the warning of the message if you do not understand righteousness by faith. She says, this is A.T. Jones, 
Several have written to me inquiring the message of justification by faith. It is the third angel's message. It is the third angel's message in verity. That's Ellen White. It is the third angel's message in verity. The Lord is the great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through Elders Wagner's and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented a justification through faith in the surety. It invited uh, the people to receive, uh, to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. This message of the gospel of his grace was to be given to the church in clear and distinct lines. Look at this. The world... The world, uh, that the world should no longer say that Seventh-day Adventists talk the law, the law, but do not teach or believe Christ. Church, we are to teach and believe Christ. For here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. A crisis is coming. And the way that we will be able to withstand this crisis is that we are so committed to him, so enmeshed with Christ, so indwelled with the Holy Spirit, that even as the world goes into crisis, we don't panic. And let me tell you something, there's a lot of, you, you listen to some of our preachers and, you know, they, they, it's a fear tactic they use. They tell you the banks are going to do this. Somebody, remember, I, I've told you before, someone told us the planes are going to stop flying. I said, well, if I'm on the ground, I guess that's Okay. They start to warn you about all this stuff. And you know what can happen? We're just listening to a message from GYC, one of the, one of the messages I wasn't able to get into. Um, I wish I remember the brother's name, but it, it's on Audioverse. And, and he's talking about all of these predictions Adventists made that didn't come true. That the bank, you, one, one prediction in 2008 was you need to go to the bank and take out all your money because you won't be able to take it out. And if you don't go by Friday, you won't be able to. And you know what begins to happen? We get so caught up in conspiracy theories. We get so caught up in the, uh, in, the, in the tangential that we forget to focus on what actually matters. Let me tell you something. You do not have to be afraid of the end of time if you are in Christ Jesus. I don't care what the banks do. I don't care what the planes do. I don't care what the environment does. I'm not afraid of that stuff. I'm not going to overly dwell on it. Why? Because my focus now must be on Christ Jesus. The more I'm looking at what, how crooked and messed up the government is, the more crooked and messed up I become. Because by beholding, we become changed. And you will not stand the last trial if what you're focused on is what the world is doing. If you're going to stand in the last trial, you're going to do so because you're focused on what God is doing. What Christ is doing. That he is leaving the most holy place of the heavenly temple. That he's walking out and he's going to take off his priestly robe, church. And my God, Jesus, is going to put on the kingly robe. He is going to adorn himself in his kingly garb and he's going to call every angel in heaven, every single one of them. And Revelation says he's going to mount a white horse. And then when he comes to earth, a sword will come out of his mouth. A name will be written on his thigh that no man can read. And he's going to ride on King Jesus. That's where my focus is. Because guess what? Every prophecy ends with Jesus winning. In Daniel chapter 2, this big old statue is made and it ends with feet of iron and clay. Do I, should I focus on the iron and clay? On the fact that a rock is going to be taken out without hands and it is going to demolish it and set up a whole new kingdom and that that one's going to last forever. That's where my faith is. My faith is in the fact that Jesus will overcome. I'm not afraid of the occult. I'm not afraid of the, the witch doctor or the voodoo man. I'm not afraid of the obia man either. Because my strength, my hope, my trust is in Jesus Christ. And let me tell you something, they're going to come. All kinds of crazy things are going to happen. But if you get all mixed up and start looking at all this other stuff and people are worried about all these things, uh, one of the things he said in the message was some lady came to him after he preached and said that they have a tunnels that run all the way from um, Washington, D.C. to the Denver airport in Colorado. 
He said he couldn't even answer the lady. He was sitting there awestruck, like, how in the world would they build tunnels that long? And what would they do with all the exhaust? And people believe all of this stuff because it's almost, listen to me, church. This is why this message of righteousness by faith is so important in the last days. People will get caught up in stuff because they want to be as if they have some secret information no one else has. You know what secret information, you know how that word, that is also translated? It is a word called the occult. When you start looking and saying, I'm going to have information no one else has. The, 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 Revelation 18 doesn't say this, this, this angel comes down and starts to hand out secret information. It's supposed to go to everyone. And we get caught up in this stuff. It is righteousness by faith that will get us through the time of trouble that's coming. It's righteousness by faith that makes me realize that when war broke out in the Middle East and everybody started heralding, it's the end of the world. I read in my Bible in Matthew 24, uh, in verse 6, it says there should be wars and rumors of war. Jesus says, but do not be troubled. So I don't get messed up like the rest of the world when I see stuff happening. My hope is in Jesus Christ. I don't have to, I'm not going to move 15 minutes out into the middle of the woods just so I can escape what's about to happen. I'm going to move into the country so I can do better work for the people in the city. Amen. I've been called to be afraid. We're called to be victorious. Amen. That comes because we have faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. And everything I read is available to every one of us. If you're willing to submit yourself to him, study God's word and pray for the Holy Spirit. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Church, the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That's what we're after. And I want to encourage you today. The world is about to get very crazy. This is a political year. There's an election. We have two people running that most people think should not be running. So there's going to be a lot of distraction, a lot of noise all over the place for the rest of this year. I want to tell you that you cannot elect someone who will solve this world's problems. Doesn't matter who runs for the presidency. The only answer for this world, church, is Jesus. And here's the beauty. You only, he only needs a vote of one yours. You need to elect him to be king in your life. And if that's your goal today, I want you to stand as we close this message in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study a word and the three angels messages and righteousness by faith. Father God, Revelation 12 and 14 is a promise we claim. And here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Lord, we want to be in that number. Help us to develop the patience of the saints. Help us, Lord, to wait on you, not by twiddling our thumbs, but to wait on you like a waiter waits, by serving you. Help us, Lord, to be instructed in your word, to follow you whether, whithersoever you lead us. And I pray, Lord, that we would not function out of fear, that we would function out of faith now. We would follow Jesus Christ because we know in the end, he wins. Lord, we want to proclaim these three angels' messages to the world, that this work would be finished and we can all go home. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen. amen. And amen. Stay standing for the closing hymn.